Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. Beautiful morning we are having. Glad you are here this morning to worship with us. If you're here this morning and you're a guest, there is a card in your worship folder. Would you please fill that out for us so that we'll have a record of you being here today with us? And uh, it is just good to be able to come here and worship in the house of the Lord this morning. There are several announcements. I'm just going to kind of not going to read the worship folder. But on your connection card, there is a place to sign up to help us in October with the diaper changing station. We've got some people already committed to do that. You do not change diapers. So uh, please, if you've not signed up, please fill that out today. Uh, this is going to be an outreach for our church to the community of Hickory there. Uh, we did this a few years ago and had a lot of positive response from that. Also in your worship folder, there are several things there that you need to read. Uh, the pickup, uh, trash pickup for fallen here uh, for uh, Chris Eckerd there uh, on the uh, Eighth Street down here. Biker Sunday is next Sunday. Uh, there's a there is a link there to FPU Financial Peace University. I taught this class last spring. If you would be interested in join, coming and join us, there is a website there that you can go to and order your materials. Uh, backpacks for the Appalachian Christmas outreach that we've done in the past. We'll start doing those backpacks in just a couple weeks. We want to do, what well, we got, 140 backpacks to hand out. And so uh, we'll get more into that. Fallen Hero Sunday is in September. And, of course, our dental bus, which is another outreach. There's some information there for that in October. And we still could use some volunteers and help for that. So thank you all for being here this morning and worshiping with us. And we just hope that you uh, uh, enjoy uh, your day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us and bringing us here this morning. We just ask, Lord, that you open our hearts and our mind to your word. Lord, we just love you. We love the teaching that we get here on Sunday mornings. And we just thank you for um, the opportunity to, to be here. Lord, we just thank you for loving us and ask, Father, that you continue to just bless us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Randy. This is... Why don't you get his microphone or her microphone? There we are. Oh, I'm sorry. You might, <laughs> you might remember Janet Shores from the Pre Pregnancy Care Center here in town, and she would like a few minutes to chat with our church. And, of course, at least for the third year in a row since I've been here, we've allowed her to do that, and we appreciate this ministry very much. Please. Yes, and it's much more than three years. Yep. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Jude chapter 2. I'm Janet Shores from Pregnancy Care Center, and I have the privilege to stand before you and to thank you as a church family for your support and your love for the work that we do at Pregnancy Care Center. Since 1985, we has, have served women and families and men in this community. And some of you are new, you may not know what we do, but we do many things more than just free pregnancy testing. It includes limited ultrasound, material assistance, classes, education. We have a male client advocate that is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the men who come into the center with our women. We have um, referrals for uh, um, maternity homes and also for those placing for adoption. So we are there, we are serving, we are your hands and feet on the front lines for life in this community. We are pro-life, we are pro-women, pro-men, pro-choice, pro-families. And I want you to know we are here to support what you do as a church. And thank you for your support. You saw the baby bottles as you were coming in and as you're going out. I do want you to know that change does change lives. And if you take a baby bottle, fill that with checks, cash, change anything it will be used to the glory of god at the pregnancy care center so let me just real quick tell you a couple stories number one many times you're wondering what are we doing there are newsletters from june in the lobby and if you don't know who we are please pick up one because it will give you a lot of information but at the front story of the let the newsletter in june was about a woman who brought her young daughter to the pregnancy care center young meaning a young teen for a pregnancy test in this situation the girl was not pregnant 
But let me tell you, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Both that mother and her daughter trusted Christ with their client advocate while there. We know that everyone who comes through the door of the Pregnancy Care Center is a divine appointment by God. We exist for two reasons, to share the sanctity of human life with everyone who comes through our door, and number two, to share the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many times as I sit with a young woman and I hear her story, many times it's very difficult, very complicated, and yes, she has sometimes made very poor choices and decisions. But she sits before me pregnant, and I can look at her and say, I'm not sure what God is going to do, because everything you've told me, I hear a lot of really hard things. But I want you to know, and I will hand her a Bible and ask her to read Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, where God says, for I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And I will look at her and I will say, I don't know how this is all going to work out. I'm here to walk with you. But I want you to know God loves you so much that he brought you here so I could remind you today that you are precious. The baby you're carrying is precious and he loves you. So we thank you, Sandy Ridge Baptist, your bo baby bottles you have till the end of September. You will return those, please, to either the church office or the table in the fellowship hall. I remind you also the first Sunday in October is Life Chain 2018. And uh, we will send information to the church, and hopefully it will be in your bulletin. But it's a silent prayer vigil where we as a community come together with other churches to, to stand and to pray for life. First Sunday in October, 2.30 to 3.30. I appreciate you guys, and it is a privilege to worship with you this day. Thank you. Please stand with us. Please stand with us for our worship.
the ushers come as you're seated. Praise the Lord for his kindness and giving us something to sing about. Mm, how rough this would be. How rough this would be if we didn't have something to sing about. Hey, is, uh, is Silas back there with you, Eric and Melody? He, it's his birthday. We were going to harass him and everything. <laughs> Well, there'll be always be next time. <laughs> That's right. Praise the Lord for good progress today with the uh, personnel committee. Early this morning, we decided on a few things that we'll bring before the church for our next um, for our next business meeting. I do have one clarification to make under the Fallen Hero Family Weekend in your uh, bulletin on the inside right hand. It says, "Bring a well-filled basket to the Family Life Center." Well, <clears throat> I am from the north, and I thought that that was pretty clear. I mean, it's just, I guess I thought, this is a southern thing. Everyone knows what a well-filled basket is. It turns out that no, not everyone here knows what that means. So I was asked by Brother Mike Beasley to clarify that this is another way of saying pot luck, okay? <laughs> so, on those dates... Bring a lucky pot, I guess is how we say that. <laughs> Who has a guest they'd like to introduce? All right, go ahead, Hazel. Glad you're here, Crystal. Thanks for being here. Okay, go ahead, Marianne. Thanks so much for being here. Wonderful. Well, good things do happen at Bojangles, praise the Lord. Glad you're here, Tina, and your whole family appreciate you being here. Who else has a guest they'd like to introduce? Go ahead, Kathy. Glad you're here, Sean. Thanks for being here. Who else? Anyone in the choir have someone they need to introduce? Okay, okay. Christy and her mom are here. Is it? Yeah, wave at us. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. This afternoon at 4.30 in my office downstairs, we'll be meeting with those of you. Okay, we'll be right back. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you, you're a good sport. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Ron, appreciate you being here. He had his knee replaced, what, four days ago, and here he sits. We appreciate you being here, Ron. Amen. You know, I mean, uh, some people say, oh, it's going to be weeks, we won't be there for weeks, you know. And I expected, every now and then you get a zealot that says, see you Sunday, Pastor. And I thought, okay, yeah, see you Sunday, Ron. And uh, sure enough, I'm seeing Ron on Sunday. That's really, that's, <laughs> appreciate that, that's great. Let's see, what was I going to say? It was my office, 430, bless you, brother. Um, <laughs> If you are not a member and you're considering membership, you can meet me in my office at 4.30. We have a class for those considering membership. The easiest way to get there is to come in the rear entrance, the office entrance, and uh, we'll meet in my office. I have materials for you, and we'll uh, be going over the topic of membership at Sandy Ridge Baptist Church. 
Let's pray. My Lord and my God, how great, grateful we are to be in your presence. We're so thankful that you didn't live here overnight. You dwell in the praises of your people. You dwell where we gather, where two or three are gathered. Thank you, Lord, for Matthew 18, the reality of the church having Christ in their midst. Thank you for meeting us here. Lord, we know that we didn't get your presence here because of some great work that we've accomplished. You are here because of the great work that Jesus Christ accomplished. We are thankful for that. Some of us, we look back over our week and we wonder why you even bother with us. I'm just glad that you do. And I'm grateful that you do because of Jesus. Lord, we come before you to offer up a small portion of what you've given to us for the carrying on of the ministry here, everything from from keeping the lights on to having pastors and staff around to supporting world missions right here in these moments of normal week-by-week giving. Lord, we give you thanks for paying your bills. You do such a good job. And then you give us so many godly men and women who help us manage those funds, and you give us opportunities to meet and vote and talk about how we're going to manage funds. And uh, Lord, you're so kind to us. Week after week, day after day, in this Sandy Ridge Baptist Church, you are kind enough to bring people to our presence, and I pray that they will feel welcomed with us. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd glorify yourself in our midst today. I pray that those who have come back time and again will see that they are in the presence of God and that people here care about them. I pray, Lord, that you would receive optimal praise, that you would receive sacrificial praise. And I pray that you'd use these monies as a way of praise to pay the work, pay the bills for the work around here. Lord, thank you that we don't have to talk much about money. Thank you that uh, this is a place that is safe from people uh, blitzing you for money. I thank you, Lord God of heaven and earth, for the word that you have written, for the mighty scriptures that are taught and preached here regularly, that we form our philosophies around and our behavior is curved because of what we read in the Bible. Thank you for the sweet Holy Spirit and how he ministers to us. And now, O Lord, we ask you, as you have already, to be present with us and to take over this worship service. And we will thank you in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen.
righteousness, O oh God, how I need you. Amen. Let's pray together. My Lord and my God, we do need you. I pray that every person in this assembly today will know they have full freedom to pray and to be in, be in your altar if need be. If God leads them, I pray that they'll pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is prompting them. I pray that you would bless, Lord, what's happening in children's worship today, that you would encourage them through the speaking, the, the teaching of the folks working in that ministry now. Lord, we do thank you for the music ministry here. Thank you for those who work tirelessly to bring us quality worship. Thank you for those working in audio visual. Lord, people that volunteer work long, hard weeks to do well at their jobs, and then they come here and serve. Lord, thank you for them. I pray that you take your word, drive it deep into our hearts. And I pray that you would glorify yourself through the very clear preaching of the word. I pray just that, that you would remove all ambiguities out of my speech and that I would be, uh, I should we say, enabled to make things clear so that nobody stumbles over the preacher today. And we will thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please take the book of God and go to the book of Job, chapter number 13. The book of Job, chapter number 13, tonight's, tonight's series in Colossians will continue, and we'll start this morning in the book of Job, verse thir uh, chapter 13. I don't say it enough, I want to make sure that we express gratitude to the folks that work in our security ministry. I'm grateful that this is a relatively safe place because of people who every six or seven weeks take their turn keeping us safe while we worship. I remember when I did that as a younger man in the army, and I remember thinking, I'm so glad that we don't have to do this in the States. I remember when I had to stand with an M16 in an environment of combat to protect people who were worshiping, and I remember thinking, I'm glad we don't have to do this in the States. It's amazing what 15 years can do to a civilization. And I'm glad that we have brave men who will stand in the gap for us while we worship. Thank you for taking your turn. <laughs> Amen. Job 13, and we'll begin reading in verse number 13. Uh, in case you're wondering, Job is Bible speak for job. That's how it's spelled, J-O-B. Uh, but that's not how it's pronounced in Hebrew, so we break all the English rules as usual to pronounce it, Job. Look at verse 13. Here's Job speaking. Hold your peace with me and let me speak. Then let come on me what may. Why do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite should not come before him. Listen carefully to my speech and to my declaration with your ears. The reality, friends, is that there are many of us throughout our lives who wonder if God is worth following. Now, we would never admit to it. This is a worship service, and we wouldn't dare appear less than spiritual, would we? But the reality is there's probably been times of crisis in your life when you have wondered if you are wrong about this thing. What if there's a plan B? What if there's no plan A at all? What if this is really just the opiate of the masses? What if we are just convincing ourselves that something is true that may be true in a way but is not true at all. The reality is I remember my earliest crisis of faith, I think it was, I was 14 years old and I remember having this deep, deep, deep onset of depression. Did you know 14 year olds could suffer with depression? Apparently, I was the first one that I had ever met that suffered with it. That doesn't mean I was, it means I was the only one that, that I knew that did. I remember being 14 years old and being so under despondency that I thought to myself, if I knew what would happen to me when I died, 
I would kill myself. 14 years old. Did you know 14-year-olds think that way sometimes? We better be careful. We better be careful to remember that our little ones are, at, are, are in a culture that glorifies death and is deathly afraid of it. Somehow we love games and movies that have so much violence in them that people are seeing by the time they're eight years old more murderers, even if they're theaterized in TV shows, than we ever would see in 20, 30 years in our generation. Now they're seeing them on video games where you can actually become proficient at killing someone without ever seeing them. And we have an entire military culture that might kill thousands of people without ever looking at a person in the flesh and blood face drones and tomahawk missiles where people's lives are counted almost as nothing well in that culture we better be ready for an increase of the popularity of suicidal thoughts and then on to a different topic but kind of the same I think when I was 16 years old I remember I was working in Burger King in Sun Prairie Wisconsin I started working there when I was 14 worked there for five years because my dad wouldn't let me quit and um and uh, that wasn't a bad thing to learn. If you, you know, if you make that happen, your kids might not spend their time quitting all their jobs the rest of their lives. Are you still with me? I'm, I know I'm meddling there a little, but it's worth it. And I remember uh, being so deeply in question about my relationship with the Lord that I remember taking a bag of trash out the back of the restaurant and hurling it up over the uh, dumpster wall into the dumpster and slumping up against that brick wall of the dumpster and, and crouching and weeping, thinking, if I knew of a better way. Wondering, is God even listening to me? I was much bothered. Here I am trying to have a church facade in my youth group and I didn't even know if there was a God, at least in my thinking. If there was, why won't he speak to me? Why is the heavens brass? Why does it look like the angels have gone on siesta or have gone on vacation and they're on a siesta? Why does it look like God has decided that he only answers prayers of other people, if at all? And I remember thinking, that if I could, I would walk away. I don't know what it was that day or every day since then that I've had those thoughts, but I would like to think it's God's strong hand under the circumstances or above them pulling me back to himself. And here in Job chapter 13, verse 15, we're dealing with a man who in verse 15 says, though God slays me, I will trust in him. Three areas of crisis, number one, a crisis when life is happening to you. Life is happening to you. Go ahead and put it up. So we have the first of three crises when life is happening to you. So in verse 15, it says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. You might have a version of the Bible that says, Though he slays me, I have lost hope or whatever. The, the reality is in the Hebrew, a lot of people say, Well, even the versions of the Bible don't agree with each other. Well, the reality is they do agree with each other. It's just that the Hebrew language has certain words that can be translated as direct opposites. It's pretty wild. One of them is curse and bless. It's the same Hebrew word. Context determines which way you translate it. Another one is come and go. It's the same Hebrew word. What matters is the context, and that's how you decide how to translate it. Here, trust is one of those words, and that's why some translations have it as, though you slay me, I cannot trust in you, or I've lost hope. But what is not up for debate is the second phrase. It's the same in every translation. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him, or I will maintain my way before him. Job is speaking great courage, no matter how your translation reads, and we still have faith in the Word of God, even if translation issues arise, they are solvable. And here, you have trust as a great word. I will wait on him, if he, even if he slays me, even if he kills me. Earlier in the book of Job, chapter number 6 and verse 11, Job says, what is my strength that I should hope? And here, Somehow, Job, in answer to one of his friends, he has three or four friends. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the book of Job. He begins the book of Job being told that he's a perfect and upright man, one who fears God and eschews or repels evil. And Satan and God have a conversation about Job. 
Satan comes before, before God and basically implies that God is not worth worshiping if his people don't have tons of stuff and perfect health. I'm going to say that again. This book is not about be nice and endure to the end of the week and God will bless you with lots of camels. That's not the story. The idea here is that this book begins with an implication or an indictment against God. And Satan says, the only reason Job worships you is because you've hedged out all evil from him. All of his kids are healthy. All of his investments are sound. All of his uh, herds are healthy. Everything is fine. No one is disloyal to him in his organization. And that God, frankly, is why Job serves you. And remember that God takes away Job's stuff. Yes, God did. Job gives him credit for it, and God apparently through the hand of Satan took Job's things. Otherwise, this phrase is not even accurate. God isn't the one killing Job. But in fact, God doesn't argue with Job at the end of the book. God takes the credit for everything that happens to Job. Christian, you and I better realize real quick that things do happen to us, but they don't just happen. Everything that happens in our lives goes through our Heavenly Father's perfectly watchful hands. Everything that occurs to us is because He has given it the nod. He has said yes to it. Everything that happens in our lives, distasteful and unwholesome in our eyes, are from God's great and mighty hands. You say, well, I don't know about that God. Neither did Job. That's my point. And then in the second chapter, Job is childless and richesless. <laughs> Poe. He has nothing. And Satan comes back before God and says, Oh, yeah, I mean, you took all his stuff and he still worships you, but what will a man give for his health? And God says, You can touch him, but don't kill him. He goes back and takes his health. Man, Job would be such an easy read if it went from chapter 3 to chapter 42. You know, if, if we could just go from bad day to, wow, everything's doubled. Even his wife is pretty again. I mean, chapter 2, it doesn't work well for Job's wife. We get the names of his daughters in chapter 42. We get nothing about Job's wife. Don't know anything about her. It's probably so no one would use the name. I don't know. In any case, by the end of the book, apparently he has a wife. It might be the same woman, but he has 10 new children that were born to him in his old age, and uh, he has double what he had before he lost it. And in between is heart-wrenching question marks from friends that should have known better, and they didn't. They started out well. They sat with him for a week without saying anything. We ought to be very careful about hurrying through periods of mourning. We ought to be very careful about hurrying people through periods of mourning. We need to realize that even Job's friends had enough sense to let Job mourn for a week before they even spoke. Some have said, well, what do we do if a loved one dies and we're trying to make plans? Do we have a visitation, a wake? Do we have, you know, the funeral? It's exhausting. And the reason it's exhausting is for a lot of reasons. We have lots of people who want to hurry through M-O-U-R-N, mourning. We don't really want to invest anything emotionally into someone's grief. We pull up for our little handshake through the line and off we go the rest of our lives. The reality is people who are going through grief, who are hosting or receiving, are oftentimes well aware of that. And they really don't want people to fake it. We as a Christian church, we as the membership of Sandy Ridge Baptist Church have to at least learn that from Job's friends, that they were with him through uncomfortable times for a long time and didn't feel like they had to be the greatest psychiatrist on the earth. They said nothing. Brothers and sisters, we can learn a lot from that. We are good at casseroles, thank the Lord. We are good at desserts, and I'm grateful for it. My profile, if I just turn to the left or right, you can see I've eaten well since I've been here. I'm grateful for food. But what we don't seem to have an awareness of is the necessity to mourn well. And here Job is learning how to mourn well. It even happens in our apologies. If you could just hurry up and forgive me, we could get back to normal. The way that it was. We can just kind of act like I didn't wound you. It's very unrealistic. We could at least learn that from Job's friends, right? 
Now here's Job. He has three friends that show up, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they go through speeches, and Job replies to them for nearly 38 chapters. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. Eliphaz speaks, Job answers. Bildad speaks, Job answers. Zophar speaks, Job answers. It happens three times, and they get through the rotation, two of the three people on the third time. And, and what happens? Uh, well, Job is done. He cuts off Bildad in Job 25. It's six verses long, and Job says, Enough! And for six chapters, Job preaches. And then this young man who I think is the author of Job, Elihu, shows up and for six or eight chapters he talks about how great God is. That is the book of Job. But here in this middle portion of Job chapter 13 and verse 15, Job, listen friends, does not have chapter 42 in his King James Bible. Job is living right in the middle of the muck. And he says, God, if you kill me, I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing even if you're killing me. Friends, this is a crisis of faith. What, but what choice did Job have? I just want to say that if you're one of those people right now that is just holding the two-minute turn like we say the AC-130 Spectre gunship, if, if we would just hang on to what we're doing and keep our eyes on the target even when it looks like God has killed us on his way out of the room, well, then you're in good company. Job did this very thing. Job had a crisis, and I wish I could just say that Job wakes up one morning, and it's chapter 42, and everyone's healthy. And here is what Job basically says, God might not deliver me out of this. It may end up killing me. Kind of like the three Hebrew children. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, but if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow. We may die in this fire, but we're going to wake up in the presence of God with a clean conscience. And it's very important, friends, that we understand the value of a clean conscience. Can you stand in the middle of your trial? I hope you and I can and look around and see nothing but turmoil and say, but God, you're still plan A. I have no better option. Even if you kill me, I will still trust in you. If I could put it in preacher speak, and this is pretty important because I think about you a lot. Even if everyone thinks I mean them harm, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing for their good. You know, even in chapter 14, if you look over in verse 7, there is hope for a tree. If it's cut down, it will sprout again. Its tender shoots will not cease, though its roots may grow old in the earth. Its stump may die in the ground. Look at this. A stump smells. I mean, look, not stinks, smells. Look at verse 9. At the scent of water, it will bud. I mean, all we have is a stump in the ground. And Job says, there's hope when a stump is cut, when a tree is cut off to the stump. As soon as it smells water, you see a stubborn little sprout, a little sapling come up out of the stump. He says, what does that teach me? Verse 10, verse chapter 14, that a man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last, and where is he? Verse 12, man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake, nor will he be roused from their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past. God, if you're killing me, can we hurry up and get it over with? And then just keep me dead until resurrection morning. Because when I awake, verse 14, when I awake at the end of the verse, I will wait and my change will come. See, Job didn't expect chapter 42 until resurrection morning. And it came earlier. But the fact is he didn't know it was coming earlier. And I just wonder, have you realized at least what Job has realized, what I'm trying to realize is that at least we can learn what a tree knows. Job said, I'll tell you how long I'll maintain my works before him. Chapter 13, verse 15. I'll wait until I'm dead and raised if I have to. I don't care if God kills me tonight and puts me in the ground and I have to wait till resurrection morning to get what's coming to me. I'm going to keep doing the right thing and that will be validated when I stand before God. So before we identify with Job and make all of our trials and testings those of Job's, let's make very well sure that we are righteous like Job. Because if we're not righteous like Job, at least 
in idea, at least quantifiably in some way, people can say we're just people, upright, fear God and eschew evil, then we have no business identifying with Job in his trial. The fact is, if we are not people who fear God and repel evil, then what we're in the middle of may very well be a boat or sized whipping from our Heavenly Father. But for the rest of you, as you look around in the darkness and you wonder, how long will I keep doing what I'm doing and not see payback? Until death. But I, I thought this was supposed to be an easy thing, this Christian life. I learned from Job today. Job says, I don't care if I die holding on to my integrity, my integrity stays. And he found it in chapter 2, his wife may leave, but his integrity stays. I don't know if you've ever thought about it and reduced it to terms like Job is having a marriage breakup. And in the face of that woman who's going to leave him in the trash heap and be on her way, in the face of that reality, she says, why do you retain your integrity, curse God, and die? Right? So friends, I don't know if you've had a crisis of faith because life feels like it's just dropping in on you, but if you have... Maybe a, a song that I've enjoyed listening to, and I'm not singing this one. Think through these words. Letting go of every single dream, I laid one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I try to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight, no matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. This is not a hope so, this is a sure thing. This is the same Job who said, I know that my Redeemer is alive. So I don't know what you're waiting on. It could be an infection to clear for you to have surgery. It could be uh, parents who are digressing in their health and you just wonder if there's relief. Well, in that crisis of faith, maybe you should sit down with Brother Job and find what he found. Someone just kept pulling you back. Number two, I need you to turn to Psalm 73. Look at Psalm 73, please. These next two will be much shorter. Psalm 73 is the second of our case studies of crises of faith. I want you to look at verses 1 through 3. Of Psalm 73. If you haven't found it yet, fine, keep turning if you want, but listen as I read the first three verses. This is Asaph. This is not David. Truly, God is good to Israel. I mean, he's good for Israel. I know how to put it. I mean, can you almost see it if it was in today's Facebook? Yeah, God is great. Or uh, how would we say it to him? Yeah, God is good all the time. Hashtag blessed. Truly God is good to Israel, but to, to such as are pure in heart. Now look at verse 2. Look what he does. But as for me, are you seeing this? Asaph says, I know we're supposed to say God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. I know I'm supposed to flash Romans 8.28 up on my status. I know I'm supposed to have a bumper sticker that says, too blessed to be stressed. I know I'm supposed to have the license plate on the front of the car that says Jesus is my, my homeboy. Verse 2, but I don't feel that way. I hear everyone around me saying how good God is to Israel, but not for me. As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Everyone's talking about how great God is, but... 
Every time I turn around, I nearly fall. Verse 3, what made it worse? I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I mean, look at them. Everything they do touches. I mean, they got the Midas touch. They're making all the money. They've got all the health. All their family is pretty and not struggling with anything. Verse 4, there's no pangs in their death. They die like everyone else. They all go to the same hospice and they die like regular people. I don't see any issues. And he complains and complains. Verse 10, his people return here and the waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? They come to church and they put on the face and I know how wicked they are, God, Asaph says. You know, I mean, he complains and complains. It's a great psalm if you're feeling downcast and need some company. He'll get with you and kick rocks and eat worms. It's really fantastic, really. And then he says, um, verse Verse number 18, you, you cast down them like destruction. Forgive me, verse 17, here's how I felt until I went into the sanctuary of God and I understood their end. He says in verse 21, my heart was grieved, I was vexed in my mind, I was foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. So Asaph is now, Asaph is now turning around and talking to God. I didn't know I struggled with dyslexia until just then. Asaph. Verse 22, I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. I spoke out of my mind to you, God. I'm continually with you. You hold me by my right hand, even when I don't feel you holding me by my right hand. Verse 24, you'll guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Look what he says in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's none on earth upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and heart fail I mean, my heart is still broken, God, but I have no one but you. And there's no record, friends, that Asaph went home and found that his wife had cleaned out the accounts and took the couch and the dog and left. There's no account of that. There's no account that someone took his car and ran a key down the side door. There's no account of that. What we're dealing here is with a real life dealing with struggle. Everywhere I look, I see no payoff for what I'm doing for God. And I look everywhere else and people who don't think for five seconds about the Lord are doing fine. I, I don't know about you, but Bill Sturm, every now and then, well, okay, just about every day I'll ask someone, have you thought about anything timeless today? Waiters, people at uh, pay booths, you name it. I'm talking about gas station attendants. Have you thought about anything eternal today? When I knock doors in our neighborhoods from time to time, you know, knock on their door. How, how are you? Have, I don't like people coming to my door either, but let me ask you a question. Have you thought about God recently? Do you know, it, it just amazes me how many people say no. And you want to say, beautiful house, beautiful cars, beautiful family, everything's fine. I don't see anyone in your front yard fixing anything. Everything looks just dandy. And we're going to be tempted to take a false way of treatment. I mean, the Buddhists, for example, treat you and teach you that if you want to lose your suffering, lose your passion. I have all kinds of material on that if you'd like, but their cure is care about nothing and you'll never be disappointed. But that is, that is not the apathetic view of this Asaph. He says, I am heartbroken. Verse 25, but all I have is you. It's not like, well, everything is gone now, so now all I have is you. So if you're struggling, wondering what makes sense in this life, pull up next to Brother Asaph. I wrote this prayer in June 13th, 2016, six days before we moved here. It won't be long, God. It's a fixed fight. We wait and contemplate their evil, and we see their destruction, and we see that it will soon be met with your mighty hand. We fight from victory and the fight like dying death. The place from which they fight is a place of dread. Perhaps you will help me save me today. What was I looking forward to? Well, I'll tell you what I was looking forward to. I was looking forward to wondering if I could lead a group of people as a pastor. 
I was sure that all the other pastors that I see in this world today who I know are tricking their people, misusing their people, draining their people of cash so they can have new airplanes, and I thought, why is it that they seem to fill buildings? Why is it that they can't seem to, they never, they never seem to be interested in the health of their sheep, but they seem like that they're constantly preaching messages and selling books that everyone is talking to. And, and God pulled me up next to Psalm 73, June the 13th, 2016, and showed me, yeah, but consider their end. And my prayer time quickly got to verse 25, who do I have but you, Lord? Are you having a crisis of faith that revolves around how you are trying to worship the Lord the best that you can and your unsaved loved ones make fun and mock and ridicule and they just seem to be living high on the hog? Pull up next to Brother Asaph. Eat dinner with Brother Asaph. Have some breakfast with Brother Asaph and realize they have an end coming and after all, all we have is the one in heaven. Lastly and quickly, look at John chapter 6. I'm trying to give you a license to express the fact that you're not always sure about what you're sure about. This is probably the one you're not expecting. Just go ahead and put it up on the board. We'll let them adjust while they're turning. When life is happening to you, you might have a crisis of faith. I want you to know that Job's God is worth following. When you look around and you wonder if there's a payoff for living a righteous life and being spirit-filled and sacrificing for the church of Jesus Christ, what, what, what do you do with that? Just know that Asaph's God is worth having as your God. And I look at John chapter 6, and Jesus is talking about all kinds of things that are difficult. I mean, for example, in verse 53,